Okay, um, I'm mostly going to talk about experiments. Uh, I'll put in a couple of theory interludes to uh, keep you happy, but uh, <laughs> I won't keep you totally happy. Um, okay, uh, so the topic is recognition memory, which is a very simple kind of memory. It's the memory, if you walked into this room, some of you said I've been here before, even though it might have been a long time, and, and others uh, said I've never seen this room before. So it's a simple kind of memory. It's binary. You either say familiar or not familiar. Um, and uh, I've always been attracted to it for that reason. Uh, it's, it's, it has a very simple readout, for example. Um, it has a long history of, um, of study. Uh, it's been studied in humans. It's been studied in monkeys. In humans, some of you may know the standing paper uh, showed that the capacity of this memory is gigantic, as you all know. I mean, we all know, uh, for, as far as familiarity goes, that, you know, many, many people, many, many places. Um, and so we have a, gi a gigantic capacity. And uh, studies in both humans and monkeys have shown that if there is a neural correlate of this, it is, it's typically a suppression of the response to a familiar object. So uh, when I walked in this room, I've been here before, I might have gotten less of a response than one of the new people who have never been here before. Uh, that, that's the general theme. So I'm going to talk about a study uh, that was done uh, in Richard Axel's lab uh, by Daisuke Hattori with help from uh, Yoshiaso and Jerry Rubin at Genelia and uh, Curtis Schwartz, who is also at um, Columbia. Um, and the trick in this experiment is that, as my title might have suggest, it's done in flies. So the trick in the fly is that how do you get the fly to tell you if something's familiar or not? With a person, of course, you can just get them to tell you. Uh, with a monkey, you can get them to choose, let's say, between two pictures, one of which is familiar, one of which is not. It's kind of hard to get a fly to do anything. Um, and so, uh, so what did we do? So here, here is the, what ultimately was the, was the solution to that problem. Uh, these are flies in a chamber. There are three movies here. Um, and they've been dusted with a powder. Uh, Richard likes to say that because these experiments started at Genelia, it was gold dust that we, uh, we did. So <laughs> think of it as gold dust, um, which they don't like. And so they very vigorously try to clean it off their bodies. As you will see when I start the movie, you'll see this uh, motion with the legs trying to clean. Um, and then in this first movie, uh, when this square comes on, a valve was opened, but nothing came into the chamber. And you can see the fly busily uh, uh, you know, cleaning away. Uh, they're, they're, they're very much into this. And, and the trick in this, um, this manipulation was basically to get flies in an initial state that was fairly well defined. Okay, well, the next movie now is... Go whoops, I jumped one. Sorry, now I jumped all over the place. Um, the next movie, now an odor comes in. A, 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 an odor to which the fly is unfamiliar comes in at that moment. Uh, and you can see the fly gets perturbed by the odor, stops grooming, just kind of takes a little look around, uh, and then gets back to business. Well, it gets back to business because it's a loop, actually, <laughs> which makes it easier to... <laughs> you know. But it did get back to business. And then here's the fly on the second exposure of the odor, and, and now the fly ignores the odor. So the idea is that the fly has, has come to realize the odor is harmless, doesn't, doesn't cause any problems, and now starts to uh, ignore it. So that's a behavioral test for uh, familiarity. Uh, it's odor specific. Um, and the, the, cur the curves uh, look kind of like this. So now, of course, you, I showed you a good fly, but about half the flies will stop on the first exposure to a novel odor. And within a few exposures, that drops down to a background level where everyone, sh every once in a while, they just stop anyway. So this is, it, it, these, these gray curves are in the absence, when the valve is opened in the absence of odor, and the yellow is in the presence of odor. So there, yeah? Does a single fly um, stop grooming on about half the odor? Well, this is a one-shot deal, unless you want to do it with a bunch of different odors. But uh, yeah, yeah, so these experiments are not. So this is flies. This is the same order applied again and again. That's right. It's not from one shot as usual. I mean, you only get to do this once on one fly. You only uh, the first exposure, you know, of of that. Then it's not. If you're going to keep to this order, you can't do it again. 
Okay? Uh, all right. So, um, oh, yeah, here I am. Sorry. Okay. So, let me introduce you briefly to the olfactory system of the fly. Olfaction in the fly starts in these appendages and these appendages. These are the, the antennae. Um, in uh, photo, in not photoreceptors, but olfactory receptors. So these are olfactory receptor neurons. Uh, the system is very similar to mammalian uh, uh, olfaction, which we're going to hear about, I think, in later talks. In that, th uh, there are a set of olfactory receptor neurons that express the same receptor molecule. There are of order 50 different receptor molecules. So there are 50 different sets of olfactory receptor neurons. Uh, the, the receptor neurons that re express the same receptor all get their axons together, that's this here, and go to a particular place in the antennal lobe of the fly, that's, that's this structure, um, and you can see these glomeruli, here's the one that happens to correspond to whichever odor uh, receptor was the, the target of the genetic manipulation that, that made these, uh, these uh, neurons green. But here are other glomerula, and of course there are 50 of these corresponding to the 50 types, each one dedicated to a particular type. So very structured wiring. Uh, at that point, a projection neuron, a second order neuron, gathers information from the same from one glomerulus and takes it up to two sites in the, in the brain. This is the mushroom body, which we'll talk about. This is the lateral horn, which we won't talk about. This is responsible for innate odor detection, unlearned things, so uh, not what we're talking about today. We're talking about a, a learned or a memory phenomenon. Um, and then uh, the next stage is the mushroom body, which is kind of L-shaped uh, thing. Uh, th these red uh, cells that you see are all Kenyan cells, which are what make up the mushroom body. These are the, so the, the cell bodies of the Kenyan cells, and these are their axons making this. L-like shape. Um, okay, so uh, you know it's amazing the old anatomists how much they figured out just by looking at the thing. Uh, and and uh, this is the guy who discovered uh, the mushroom body. And it, just by looking at it in different uh, kinds of insects, he got he he made this quote, which I think we would all agree with now. The the mushroom body is a flexible, uh, non-stereotyped structure in the fly brain. Uh, that really does uh, uh, give a fairly stereotyped nervous system the flexibility uh, to change and, and uh, even free will. Um, okay, so here's just a, a microscopic structure and then I'll, I'll move on. Here's the projection neuron coming up. Here is where the synapses are formed in a structure called the calyx between these projection neurons and the Kenyan cells. Here are the Kenyan cells and their axons again are coming down and making these, these lobes. Uh, you notice the Kenyan cells do not leave the mushroom body, so you have to have the, an output, and those are mushroom body output neurons that, uh, that do that. They uh, get their input from different parts of this L-like structure, and then they carry the signal off to other parts of the fry, fly's brain. And furthermore, then, every uh, one of these uh, output neurons gets dopamine uh, input. I'll show you that more clearly. And the dopamine input, among other things, drives the plasticity. So this is a completely learned system. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and, and the plasticity in the synapses from the Kenyan cells to this output neuron are driven by dopamine release from those neurons. Uh, the mushroom body has a very beautiful output structure. Uh, there are different compartments uh, defined by um, the dendrites of different mushroom body output neurons. Here you see five of them. Uh, there are five in, in three different lobe, lobe structures. So there are a total of 15, and then there's kind of a 16th one that sort of lives in here. Um, and those are independent output channels of the mushroom body. They all share the same um, axon, so they get the same information, but they output different things, and the reason they do that is because they all get individual dopamine modulation. So here are dopamine neurons that respect these compartments very tightly, and by modulating these differently uh, over time, the different output neurons can tell you different aspects uh, of an odor, and in particular, uh, the structure, whoops, um, 
is quite nicely structured. So broadly speaking, uh, the, the vertical lobes are, are associated with avoidance. So if you activate these neurons, uh, you tend to get the fly to avoid what, whatever you know, you're associating the, the activation with. And these guys are associated with rep approach. On the other hand, if you do something like a classical conditioning experiment with a fly, you don't need to use a UF. You can just use dopamine activation. And activating the vertical lobe neurons is equivalent to a reward of the fly. And activating these guys is equivalent to a punishment. And if you might notice, there's a, there's a sign you know, difference between these two. And that's because the dopamine neuron tends to weaken the synapse. So you have to put a minus sign in your brain. Uh, dopamine weakens the synapse, and therefore it, it enhances the, the opposite. All right, all make sense? OK, uh, so here's an example of, of a pair like that um, that um, uh, I'll talk about later. Let, let, let me move on from that. So, so here, the, the idea of classical conditioning in the mushroom body, then I'll get on to the business at hand, um, it looks kind of like this. That uh, a, a, an, in, an order comes on, uh, goes through a strong synapse, activates the output neuron. But if that then gets associated with something like a shock, then it activates the dopamine neuron, and the effect of that is to weaken that synapse. That means later, if another odor comes along, it'll activate the output neuron. That's the safe signal. But if the same odor comes along, now that synapse is weak, the activation is not there, and that's the danger signal. So now that, that odor would be avoided. OK, um, so one thing that, that we uh, realized, and other people, I don't think I have the references, but I'll show you some new data on this. One thing we realized is that these synapses are random. This was just anatomy. Um, and that uh, raises kind of an interesting problem because um, if they're random, what we really showed was that these have no structure, no apparent structure. And we interpret that as being random, but we didn't really show it was random. Now, one inference if it's random is that the two sides of, of the mushroom body, much, you know, the pairs of mushroom bodies in a fly's brain, should be completely different if that's true. Um, and that raises some interesting problems, but first let me show you uh, the, the, um, the data on that. So recently there is from Janelia, uh, and this is particular from Mark Zlatish and, and uh, Albert Cardona's lab, uh, there's EM reconstructions in both adults and larval flies. This is from the larval fly. So it's an EM reconstruction where you really can look on both sides of the animal's brain uh, at the connections. And here's a, a, just a matrix. I'll, I won't take any time with this, but these are just different numbers of connections. The point is, indeed, there's absolutely no relationship between the two sides of the, of the fly's brain in the mushroom body. And that leads to my first little theory in interlude. So you would say, okay, these are completely different. So are the two sides of the, of the fly's brain going to tell the fly different things? That's what we asked ourselves. And in particular, uh, now that would be true, but presumably the mushroom body isn't going to do any good until you do some kind of learning uh, here. So we asked the following question. Suppose the fly has one learning experience then how well aligned will these outputs be to other odors? Not the, of course, they'll be aligned to the learned odor because both sides of the fly learn to avoid it. But how, how, how uh, comparable will the responses on the two sides of the brain be despite the fact that these are completely randomly and differently wired? Yeah? I was a bit confused uh, by how you compare the two sides. Uh, aren't they getting like, different cells that uh, have inputs and that such like no, remember, the, these projection neurons uh, connect to a glomerulus, so they're completely defined. You know, you know which glomerulus they come from, so you know exactly which input is which. So these, in fact, I, I, I went over that very quickly, but um, this matrix, which way am I going here? This matrix along the top, these are the glomeruli. So, so these are completely defined, and, they've, and they're correspondingly so defined on the both sides. So, yeah. yeah. What, about, what about the lack? Yeah, so you have to be careful that, that going down here, these are how many inputs they, they have. But this ordering is arbitrary. Okay, this, this is just, they just label them. 
yeah, these, these, are, these are different Kenyan cells. And so we have to do a little statistics, and, and uh, Ashok uh, Kumar Litwin and I, and he did it, to tell you the truth, to, to verify that, for example, this isn't just this rearranged. Uh, you know, we have to be and careful. Are different for different slides, even the same genetics? Yeah, so, so we infer, I mean, this has only been done for one larva, but you affirm, you, we, uh, we assume it's different in different flesh, yeah. Okay, uh, so I just want to show you a little calculation. Yeah. Same without learning. Not at all. I mean, then, then. So, so why should expect? Because now you've changed these synapses but for so in an analogous manner. Let me. I'll do it with math. But this will be better for you, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the problem they were saying. We have two representations uh, in within the mushroom body that are completely unrelated to each other. We put them through weights, and then these are the output neuron responses. This is a very simple calculation. Now, those are going to be different, right, because those, those two representations are different. But now, what we say is, suppose you do a Hebbian type learning to one odor. In other words, you set this weight equal to the response of the left side to that particular odor, and you make the other weight uh, equal to the response of the right side to that same odor. So you do a Hebbian alignment. The question is, how correlated will those two uh, be to a whole family of odors, to, to across all odors, let's say. So what will the correlation coefficient of these guys be if you do this one alignment? You'll see why I'm doing this particular thing. So Evan Schaefer in particular uh, computed this. It looks like this. Um, it, Heim, since you calculated this, this thing scales exactly like the signal to noise ratio for the output of one of these things, like what Yubin Bakhtash did. It, it, it lies right on top of each other if you scale properly. But anyway, so you get a curve like this. Namely, the more Kenyan cells you have, the better agreement you're going to get on the outputs. Now, the one reason we did this is because this has actually been measured. So you can take a fly and um, assume that it's had some common experiences on the two sides of its brain and measure the correlation between the output neurons on the two sides. This was done in Glenn Turner's lab. Um, and you even get different numbers of, of uh, Kenyan cells because it was done in different lobes. And different lobes have different Kenyan cell activations. And it, it really agrees amazingly well, as you see. So these are three different pairs of output neurons that were measured, their correlation across the thing. If you do this in di different flies, it's much lower because they presumably don't have the common experience. Uh, and so, you know, this all makes sense. In other words, the two sides of the fly's brain are as correlated as they can be, uh, okay. given that, that there's... So this would depend on how many orders you consider. Yeah, yeah. So how many so, somewhat. Order? Yeah, we did it with one. Of course, we have no idea. No, overall, how many orders? You, you cross-correlate for, for a population of other orders. Mm -hmm. How many other orders should the influence occur? Yeah. So, uh... Yeah, I don't, do, why does it, it doesn't matter on that. It's, because right? if it just, you learn just one order, there's yeah. a thousand orders, mm -hmm. it's very big effect on this one. No, that's the point. It, it, no, this is the correlation across an infinite family. Of course, the experiment, I don't remember how many orders they used in the experiment. But this is the correlate. What I'm saying is once you correlate those outputs, then those, these responses become correlated. For all other orders. Yeah, for all other orders. Yeah, yeah, across an infinite family, right. Okay, so let me get back to the problem at hand. Okay, so the output neuron, so, so what you might imagine now, there are all these compartments that better get moving um, in, in the mushroom body, and so there's kind of a, 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 an enterprise here now of figuring out what the different ones do, and this work is part of that. We took one of these compartments of what's called alpha prime three. It's the topmost in one of the vertical lobes. Uh, and and it's sort of, what's it doing? Because these output neurons are conveying the learned olfactory information. Uh, and so, you know, what does this one learn? Um, so here it is. There are actually two of them. I'm probably going to refer to it as one, but there are actually two of them. Here you can see the two cell bodies. Um, and, you know, over the course of the experiment, it sort of dawned on us that it seems to be coding novelty. So let me give you the evidence of that. So the first thing is 
that um, if you repeatedly expose the, the, a, the animal to an odor, you get a response. So what you're seeing here is the response of these neurons uh, to an odor. These are the pulses of the odor, just to verify that the odor is being given in equal pulses at, at every uh, cycle here. And that very quickly adapts away. So that's the, the uh, if in, in a novelty detector, that's a, a criterion you would want. You get a response when it's novel, and that goes away. So this indeed does that. Of course, that's not sufficient, but it, it's a good start. Um, now, this had better do it to not one odor, but all odors. This neuron responds to all novel, all no odors that were tried. The odors are coming, you know, they're chemicals, so they're all novel to the fly. And what you're going to see here is this pattern of uh, adaptation as the odor becomes familiar, and then a new odor comes on, uh, and, and you see the full response, and then the new adaptation, and you can see this for a whole panel of odors. So one odor after another, after another, after another, after another, uh, becomes adapted uh, in this way. Uh, and if you go back, it's not shown on this slide, but for example, at this point, if you went back and tested the red odor, it would still give no response. So there's a capacity of the system. I'll talk a little bit about that later. That's coming. That's probably the next slide. Um, the response seems to stay down for, you know, an order an hour. So here's an experiment exactly what you're talking about to probe the system over time uh, and see how long. And so, you know, it's starting to come back up to about an hour or so. So it lasts about an hour. This is not, it's not like you where it's going to last until you get to my age and then it'll fail you. Um, but uh, it lasts for a while. Yeah, that that was not um, that was not tried. Uh, okay, so um, here is uh, yeah. I'll do this quickly because I'm I'm going to run out of time. This is not just a, a, an adaptation of the sensory uh, response because the Kenyan cells stay relatively constant over this. So the, these cells are still getting input, but they're not, um, they're not responding. It's per particular, this is just showing, it's particular to this compartment of the, a mushroom body. We could not find another compartment that had this property. Um, and now the question is, why is this thing uh, adapting away? Why is it? Our suspicion, of course, is the dopamine neuron, because I already said the classical picture here is that dopamine uh, input into a compartment weakens the synapses. Uh, so uh, first of all, the dopamine neuron had better respond to odors, and it does, uh, so that it, it has, it's a good candidate for doing this. And then here's the, you know, an experiment that convinces you uh, that it really is the dopamine neuron. Uh, this is an experiment using the, the genetic tricks of the fly. Uh, you take two fly lines. Those are these guys that are completely normal. So this is the adaptation or the, the familiarity response in these output neurons over exposures that's completely normal. One of them is carrying um, a, a uh, expression, uh, a, tra a transcription factor uh, that, from, uh, that, that is used standard in fly, and the other is carrying a potassium channel, but separately nothing happens. Then you cross those flies, uh, now you have a potassium channel expressed uh, in the dopamine neuron, and you're not getting any dopamine response, and now this effect goes away. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, six, as I said, this response goes away. <laughs> uh, I don't know what that is. I'll tell you what, what this is, though. You might notice it starts weaker. Uh, keep that in mind. We'll explain that later on. Yeah. It, it, yes, yes, that's right. No, no, these odors are, are neutral. Yeah, in this compartment, you, get, you activate the dopamine neuron for all odors. So, you know, that was a rough sketch. And, and in fact, what's happening now is sort of a fine, finer scale examination of this. Okay. Uh, Let's see. So, so here's the rough idea. I mean, I, I can do this quickly. Uh, the idea is you, ex you, you uh, have a novel odor come in, activate, 
um, Kenyan cells that activates the output neuron, but it also activates the, the, the dopamine neuron, and the result of that is a weakening in these synapses. And therefore, you don't get the novelty response anymore. Now, of course, if you did this over and over again, um, you know, if you, if you weaken the synapses here and here, pretty soon this neuron wouldn't be able to fire. So you have to have some sort of recovery me mechanism, uh, a forgetting mechanism, and this for me forgetting mechanism appears to be an active mechanism. So here's an example where, uh, due to an odor, this output neuron has been adapted away, and then 15 other uh, novel odors were exposed during this time period, and you can see a recovery. Uh, so... Um, Actually, I think that's 15 times. It gets it was four odors, but multiple exposures to four odors. So it looks like exposure to other novel odors is erasing this, which is a good idea because, right, if you're exposed to a lot of novel odors, you don't want to try to remember all of them. You'll saturate the system. Uh, and so uh, never mind that. Um, and so uh, Dice K looked at that by photoactivating the dopamine neuron. So remember, the dopamine neuron is sort of like a novelty re response that weakens the synapses. And when you do that, what you find is if you've uh, adapted the natural way by exposure, and then you, you expose all these light pulses so you get dopamine, that that makes the synapse recover. Okay? Um, all right, so... Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I showed you. This is the control. Here it is recovering. Uh, okay, uh, in my rush, I, I said it. So here's the idea of the learning role. That um, when you expose, let's say you've already adapted out these synapses. When you expose a new odor, two things happen. First, these, new, these guys get weakened, but these guys get strengthened. So that there is a, both a recovery and a suppression here. And I think that takes to me Could to my... Just scaling? Huh? Could just scaling? Well, I'll show you how I modeled at any rate. I mean, how, how does it come back, you mean? I'm saying, could we just scale? So there's a scaling of the static scaling of all those things? You mean of all... Of all, all yeah, I think what happens is... Well, let me give you the rule. Let me see if it answers. So here's a little model. Again, the, out, the, out, uh, uh, the input to the M-bond is just a set of weights and then the, the firing rates of the Kenyan cells. It's the same model I had before. I guess the, the notation is a little better. And here is the inferred learning rule. So the idea is when an odor comes on, uh, a certain fraction, which is about 10%, 5% to 10% of the Kenyan cells become active. If a synapse has an active Kenyan cell, it gets weakened, and in the model, I just weaken it to zero in one shot. If the Kenyan cell is not active, then it starts to recover, and it goes back. I just scaled it to one. It starts pushing itself back up to one. So, so I, I believe this is the learning rule that's functioning, and this is just a very simple model. And you, know, you can completely solve this model. So you can look at what happens to repeated odor exposures, something like this. This is a simulation where each, each, uh, each unit here corresponds to a different odor being exposed to this model uh, mushroom body. Uh, you can see they're just random, except I arranged this one so you can actually see which, uh, which Kenyan cells were active. Um, and then you can look at the synapses to an output neuron, and here you can see that effect, where all of these synapses got weakened, and then eventually they strengthened again as the, as the novelty memory is forgotten. And you can get curves like this, uh, where what you see is that uh, you have a noisy signal because the synapses are constantly going to zero and back up again. But if you look at a particular odor, then it gets, uh, it gets completely wiped out the response and then gradually recovers. And only when an odor presented, otherwise it would last forever in, okay. yeah, in this model. So, you know, you can look at the signal size, you can look at the noise size, you can look at the lifetime. All of these things are calculable, um, and uh, you end up with a kind of a curve like this, which is a comparison of the signal-to-noise ratio to the lifetime in terms of odors, and it, it just looks like the system kind of lives here. It, it has a lifetime of about 15 odors and a signal-to-noise ratio of, you know, of an order four or something like that. Um, okay, good. So let me wind up uh, with uh, the, the bringing it back to the behavior. So... 
I would say, you know, what we've found so far is pretty much standard lore of the mushroom body, namely dopamine input combined with uh, sens sensory input weakens the synapse. Uh, we have this evidence, which is also found in some of the other compartments, for an active forgetting so that dopamine input without sensory input brings the synapse back to, to full strength eventually. Um, and, um, you know, that, that the, the thing that's different about this compartment, if you want, is that the CS and the US are the same thing. In other words, the odor drives both the sensory input and drives the, the dopamine input. And that results in this kind of novelty familiarity effect. Um, and indeed, there's a good correspondence here uh, between the behavioral time course, which is what I showed you at the beginning of the talk, and the time course for the adaptation of this output neuron. So, of course, obviously the question at this point is do these two really have a, a direct relationship to each other? And, of course, because it's a fly, you can, you can do the manipulation. You know, the beautiful thing of the fly is this split gal 4 system that allows you to target individual cell types. So, in particular, in this case, we could target the two cells that I'm talking about, two, two on each side. So, it's four cells in the fly that are being manipulated uh, to, in what I'm about to show you. And there are two manipulations. The less convincing one is to activate those neurons. So uh, what's happened is genetically light, uh, uh, crimson light activated channel has been put into those cells uh, so that Dice-K can activate it with light. Um, here you're seeing the control animals, again, the animals that have not yet been crossed, so they should be normal. Um, they don't respond to the light at all. They just, they don't see the light very well because it's a red shifted light. Uh, it's, a, it's quite a red light. Um, and so they don't react. And now I'm going back to behavior. So this is the fraction of flies who stopped grooming. They did not stop grooming to the light. About 50% of them stopped grooming when the light was tied with an odor, which is, again, the normal behavior. Um, but if you use the animal with the crimson in these output neurons, then in fact, the light activated about uh, the same level as the odor of, of stopping. And when you had light plus odor, you got you know, a much higher level of stopping. So activating these neurons does give you, give you some sort of alerting response. But as I said, the more convincing experiment is this one. This is a silencing experiment. So again, here are the control flies. 50% of them stop. Uh, when exposed to a novel odor. And uh, over time, on the second trial, you know, very few of them, this one, none of them stopped. Here, a few of them stopped. And it, you know, goes down across trials. Uh, but if you silence these output neurons, um, then it, you essentially you can never get an alerting response. So, so we would argue that these, these uh, flies, when the lights are, you know, well, this isn't light, so this is, this is just a potassium channel. These flies cannot detect that a novel, uh, an odor is novel. Everything's familiar to them. Um, okay, um, I will wind up there. The idea is that uh, this compartment, we don't know if it's all that it does, but this compartment seems to uh, be associated uh, with familiarity or novelty. Um, it gives a response to novel odors. Um, I think that that novel response very well may alert the learning system uh, to, to uh, then you know, be vigilant and say, is there, is there any association with this novel odor? And if so, activate learning. And then the next time, it's not a novel odor, but it could be a scary odor. Um, and the other is that I think it's a nice demonstration of what we all believe but that um, you know, memories really are stored at synapses. These memories are stored at synapses uh, by, in this case, a dopamine modulated system. Um, and you, know, you can do the, the causation experiment that really does suggest that it's, it's, the, it's the state of these synapses that encode whether a no odor is novel or not novel to a fly. All right, I'll stop there. Yeah, Peter. The, the dopamine neuron, you mean? So, you know, we, we were kind of hoping that the output neuron activated the dopamine neuron and did that experiment, photo, you know, um, uh, but it, 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 it does not require it. I mean, we silenced it. So there is a pathway from olfaction to this dopamine neuron 
I mean, it, there's no possible pathways. It's not like we traced it, but I think it's just directly activated by odor. Because there's another novelty. There's a another novelty. No, because it doesn't stop. Uh, it doesn't stop. It goes down a bit. So I think what happens, it does get uh, input from this guy, perhaps, and that enhances it, but it never stops. Yeah, yeah, I worried about a second one, too. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So is this fact that the mushroom body seems completely random crucial for this? Yeah, no, no, I, I don't think it's crucial. I mean, it, I think what it indicates is it's really for learning with an unbiased starting point. Um, and I don't think it's crucial, but if, if you're going to be unbiased, why not? You know, why bother to wire it up in a systematic manner when that's not going to be particularly useful? Yeah, it might, it might have been useful. I, I, I'll tell you a little, a little lie that I, that I told. You remember when I showed that matrix, maybe I can go back to it, when I showed that matrix of, um, of the EM results, um, Okay, you, you have six clause, five clause, four clause, three clause, two clause, there's one claw too, and they're not random at all. They're one-to-one -one wired. During development, they're the first ones to develop. So what happens is the system develops deterministically, systematically, to make sure it gets all the olfactory inputs, and then it goes random. Uh, so it, it, it's really nicely programmed. <coughs> It's not randomness for randomness sake. It wants to get a diversity of input. And at first it does that in a systematic way, and then it becomes random. Alex? I think you've already answered my question, but I want to check. So presumably in the different compartments, um, the learning rule is the same. The interaction between presynaptic, postsynaptic, and dopaminergic activity is the same. So the difference in, is how the dopaminergic neurons respond to the inputs. So in this case, it's novelty because it responds to all these. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's partially. But there is evidence that, for example, the lifetime of memory can be different in different compartments. Now, that could, again, be related to the activation of the dopamine neuron, but it really could be that the, the synaptic mechanism is a little different in different compartments. Some are very long-term memories, some are more short-term memories. So um, at least that, but there could be more to it as well. Yeah. Yep. So why bother dopamine? There must be times when you can easily get depression, right? It seems crazy to have all dopamine for the second. There must be times when maybe it's not turned on or. You mean, wh yeah, why to do it? Well, I mean, one thing I, I think is this system, you know, all the other compartments work the same way where the dopamine is activated in a much more controlled way, like to a shock and everything. So, you know, it may have just been, there it is all like that, and, and that, that was the plasticity that was around. Um, I guess that would be my argument. Yeah, I agree. You didn't, you didn't have to do it this way. Yeah. 